Okay, hello. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, the 10th webinar in the new barn raising webinar series. Um, today's subject is responsiveness to users. So ensuring that uh, in the case of today's uh, webinar, museums and libraries are responding uh, to the needs of, of their users. Uh, my name is Gareth Potts. I'm the guy who's been sending you lots of emails promoting the webinar series. Um, I also set up the webinar series. Um, there is a website, uh, thenewbarnraising.com, that uh, has lots of uh, resources for people interested in working to sustain uh, community and civic assets, whether it's museums and libraries or parks, recreation centers, theaters, senior centers, those type of things. Uh, on that website, there is a toolkit. Everything is free. Uh, a toolkit outlining practical tips around raising awareness, raising money, raising volunteer help. Uh, there's also a handful of articles that are more concise summaries of the key things you'll find in the toolkit. Uh, and there are links to the, the, this webinar program, both uh, how to register for the remaining webinars uh, and how to access the YouTube channel that has recordings of previous webinars. So I hope you're able to, to give, give that website a look at some stage. In terms of today's focus, uh, the central question really is how can people who manage museums and libraries, but, but also other types of assets, respond to their user base. And that can really have several different aspects in terms of, you know, are they offering relevant programming and how do they offer relevant programming? How do the products that are on offer reflect user needs and respond to user needs, whether it be items in a museum or books or DVDs, other things in a library? Um, you know, what kind of new ways of delivery are there in terms of um, you know, perhaps, perhaps new types of, using new types of technology, uh, maybe rethinking the, the spaces, maybe rethinking the types of staffing and the type of type of activities that are, that are done by the organisation. So that that's what's what we're going to look at today. Uh, just a few words really about the two speakers today. Um, the first speaker is Pirana Reddy. Pirana is the director of public programmes and community engagement at Queens Museum in, in New York City. Um, she's been in post since 2005, so she's eminently qualified to, to talk about this type of uh, work. Uh, on the pro uh, public program side, she oversees film screenings, talks, festivals, and various other uh, artistic performances. Uh, on, the, on the community engagement side, uh, the museum she oversees the museum's uh, arts and culture work with, that, that has a, a strong social development angle. She also oversees artist residencies. Uh, that, have, that have been running at the museum for several years now. And she's also overseeing um, a, a social practice master's degree. This is a, a joint program between the museum and a local university, Queen's College, um, which will, she'll be talking some more about that uh, during the webinar, I think. And then in terms of her educational background, she has a, a master's degree in cinema studies from the Tisch School at New York University, um, which even I know is a, a very prestigious school. Um, the other speaker is Chris Viesma, who is the director of the new library at Almera in the Netherlands. Uh, Chris uh, has had various roles prior to, prior to his, his current director role uh, in the city of Groningen in the Netherlands. He served as the director of the library there, and he was also head of the city's public services. Uh, at a national level in the Netherlands, he's the vice president of the Organization of Public Libraries, the VOB. Uh, within Almera, within the city of Almera, he is the president of uh, an alliance of, of Almera cult cultural organizations, the DOCA. Um, in terms of his background, he was educated as a librarian and then more recently uh, as a digital leader. Um, so without further ado now, uh, I'm going to pass you over to Pirana in New York, who's going to talk to, to you about uh, her work. So uh, Pirana, over to you, please. Hi, um, this is Prana Reddy uh, from the Queen's Museum. I'm the Director of Public Programs and um, Community Engagement here, and I've been working at the Queen's Museum since 2005. Um, so just to get started, I want to give you a sense of um, where is the Queen's Museum. While New York City, as you might know, has lots of museums. Um, we are the primary fine arts museum in the borough of Queens, one of the five major areas of New York City. Uh, as you can see from the subway map, um, 
you have uh, an, a red arrow here to this green swath, which is in Flushing Meadows Park, um, the flagship park of the Borough of Queens, and we are located inside that park on the far northeastern side of the city. Uh, and that means um, that uh, actually we are not in an area that is a tourist center, um, unlike, you know, the MoMA and the Met and, and many of the other museums that are based in Manhattan or downtown Brooklyn. And therefore, we have the particular challenge of uh, serving a more local community of New York City and of the neighborhoods around Queens. And the neighborhood that we are closest to is uh, Corona, uh, which for um, historically has had lots of demographic shifts. Um, in the earlier part of the 1900s, it was a primarily Italian neighborhood, some of the remnants of which are still visible in, in certain parts of the neighborhood, as you can see the uh, Salomaria and the Bocce Ball Court. And then um, another area of it in, in the kind of middle part of the 1900s was a, a safe area for uh, black Americans to find housing. And we and many jazz greats actually made Corona their home and felt comfortable in that environment um, where they were kind of shut out of the housing market in a lot of Manhattan due to racism. Louis Armstrong. Um, for example, had his house there, and, it, and that is a museum, historic house museum at the moment. Um, and in the last, since the 80s or so, uh, 1980s um, till now, we've had an influx of immigrants uh, coming from uh, South and Central America. And at this point, Corona is 70% Latino, um, but from a mix of, of different Latino countries from the Caribbean um, at first, Dominican uh, populations, and then Colombian, and more recently as a, um, Mexican and Ecuadorian. Um, and we also have a smattering of a variety of Asian immigrants uh, from India, Pakistan, Korea, and China. And actually, um, the neighboring um, area, Flushing, is, is, is the largest uh, Chinatown or Asian community, immigrant community in New York City, much bigger than the Chinatown in Manhattan. And, and there's an, as that is continuing to increase, we see more Asian migrants moving into Corona. Um, and when we look at the, the kind of socioeconomic statistics for um, the, the um, population of residents nearby the Queens Museum, we see that 70% of the population is foreign born and about half um, are not technically English fluent. Uh, up to 25% are undocumented um, and, and don't have uh, legal papers to live and work in the United States, and almost a quarter live below the poverty level and have a much lower um, education um, attainment rate than the city at large. And so this is not generally a museum-going audience, or they have not had a history even in their home countries of going to museums. And so that presents a particular challenge for a museum like ours, which is a contemporary art museum and um, presents a variety of work, um, you know, in that medium and not a, a traditional or folkloric um, hub. Um, we don't have a kind of collection of artifacts or historical uh, artworks, and we, we're primarily a temporary um, contemporary art exhibition with some historical elements based on our building's history, which I will get to now. Um, so the museum, um, if you could see the, like in the center of picture, there's a giant globe, which is called the Unisphere, that was built for the 1964 World's Fair that was held in the park by U.S. Steel and has become the kind of symbol of the borough. And we're the kind of low slung rectangular building to the left of that. And, oops, sorry. And as you can see, we're surrounded by parkland, uh, by large uh, sports complex like the U.S. Open directly to the north of us. And you can see the Mets uh, baseball stadium was also there. And then um, a ring of highways that kind of separate the park uh, from the kind of street grid of the city. So that's another challenge physically that the Queens Museum have, has in connecting 
to um, the community of folks who live uh, within walking distance around there. As you can see, there are only kind of certain kind of pedestrian bridges that, that connect the surrounding neighborhoods to the park. Um, the building is actually the New York City Pavilion. There were two World's Fairs um, that happened at the park. This is the 1939 World's Fair, and you can see the very old car there that was on the newly built Grand Central Parkway. Um, and we, it's the only building left over from the 39 World's Fair, uh, continued to be the New York City Pavilion for the 64 World's Fair, and then housed the UN General Assembly before um, the... Uh, the building was built in Manhattan, uh, and this is a picture of the building actually uh, hosting the UN General Assembly. And so it's always had this history of kind of a convener, um, an international convener, and a site where um, Americans could learn about the world. Um, we have, as I mentioned, a, a few things left over from our World's Fair history. Uh, the largest and most um, I would say, kind of wow factor object that we have in our collection is the panorama of the city of New York, which is a 9,000 square foot two-scale architectural model of the city of New York, uh, which you see here, and which we have also used um, to address issues of concern around urban planning and development. Um, we've had artist interventions onto the panorama, for example, during the 2007 2008 mortgage crisis in the United States, we actually mapped onto this panorama um, the foreclosures throughout the city and had series of, of programming uh, both on and off site that dealt with that um, economic crisis and the impacts of that on our city fabric. And that becomes, you know, a focus for us, like we are known for dealing with those types of urban planning and equity issues um, throughout the city of New York. Um, and so one of the things that we first started to do as we were trying to overcome these challenges and, and, and also try and do something different, we have a lot of um, museums in New York City that have amazing collections, uh, encyclopedic collections, and we didn't need to do that. So we were trying to think about stories um, and artworks that reflected the narratives of, um, of Queens and of the city more um, generally that often don't get shown in art museums. Um, this is an example of a Mexican photographer, Mexican-American photographer, Dulce Pinzon, who did a series in which um, she characterized uh, a lot of immigrant uh, workers in New York as superheroes. Um, and so this was about changing our concept of, of who is seen as a hero and for why. And um, there's information there about where they're from, uh, what they what their job is and how much money that they send. And so they're kind of heroes, both in the sense of, of the way that they provide um, services here in New York City at an affordable uh, rate and also uh, contribute to the economy of the local economy of the countries that they come from. We also were interested in identifying and building cultural producers within the immigrant communities uh, themselves. And so one of the ways to do we, we started doing that when I first uh, came to the museum was to build a youth program that combined political education um, with um, artistic education. So these young people were actually paid, did an intensive program for a year and a half as employees of the museum um, to develop programming and original um, events programming and artistic programming in collaboration with uh, professional artists that we commissioned to work with them over the course of that year and a half. We also uh, wanted to become a platform for the presentation of the variety of different immigrant cultures. Um, and we're lucky and blessed to see this as an asset and not just as, a co um, as, as something that is uh, an issue or a problem in terms of communication, that we have some of the best um, dancers, musicians, et cetera, from all around the world in the Borough of Queens, a lot of whom um, are not connected to cultural organizations yet because um, they're either new to the country or they have language issues that prevent them um, from promoting themselves and, and reaching platforms for, for exhibition. And so we really devoted ourselves to, to being that platform. And a lot of the musicians, this is an outdoor series that we do um, 
every summer called Passport Fridays, where every week we highlight um, performers and films from uh, different countries um, of local artists who come from a variety of, of places in the world. Um, the other thing that we've done is um, we, we don't like to use the word outreach um, because the point is not just to bring people to the museum, but it's actually to create um, a real sense of engagement and partnership with our local communities. And so we had to kind of come up with a sense of like, what, how do we define our engagement? What are the rules for our engagement, the values for our engagement? Um, and one thing that we committed ourselves to at the beginning was that the museum should actually see itself as a local player, as a good neighbor, um, and that would be accountable to local residents over the long term. And not just kind of be there whenever we have, um, want them to participate in some artistic project uh, of someone who's exhibiting at the museum, um, or just to be like, here's some free classes that we have. But we wanted them to like really see us as, as partners who would help um, uh, on, on their objectives about what they wanted to see in terms of neighborhood improvement and think about how we could, as a museum with our assets, like be helpful in those regards and not just have everything about, um, you know, art education or art participation. Um, and so the other thing that we wanted to think about is like, how could we be truly dialogical in our programming development and not just say, okay, now we're going to do programming for this community and bring this, you know, Chinese artist for the Chinese community, but we want to actually work in tandem with and, and actually exchange resources with uh, local cultural producers. Um, and so we spend a lot of time trying to find people with great ideas um, and try and match them up with resources and platforms at the museum. Um, and I, I think I touched on the third piece about kind of the, the collaborative effort, efforts actually arising from community desires and not necessarily from just what we happen to be interested in or we, what we think is interesting um, intellectually uh, or artistically, but actually like how do we come to the table based on, on what the community wants to work on, uh, what kinds of changes they'd like to see in their neighborhoods. Um, and then asset-based based community building approach. And that means not to just look at, I mentioned all the things that were challenging, um, you know, in, for our community members in terms of um, their struggle to become English proficient, um, you know, their challenges around kind of educational attainment and the type of work they have access to based on that or their documentation status. But they also come with a lot of amazing skills, knowledge, history, um, from their own cultures and that they can share with us and that uh, we want to build upon. Um, and then finally, that we want to work across silos. That, that means that we don't just look at partnerships with arts organizations or cultural organizations, but also with advocacy organizations, immigrant right organizations, housing organizations, et cetera. And then we, we, we try and think about um, developing cultural tools that would be useful in their work. Um, and develop relationships with artists um, and help broker those relationships with artists in a, in a way that, that those partnerships are useful and, and for both parties. Um, and that necessitates um, staff that have very particular backgrounds and skills, not necessarily just art historians um, and people with uh, arts backgrounds, but people with backgrounds in, in um, English as a second language, uh, you know, people with backgrounds as community organizers, people with backgrounds um, doing um, advocacy and policy work, et cetera. And so that really meant that we had to rethink um, who works at the Queens Museum and uh, where do we find them. Um, as I mentioned, I think one of the, the biggest things that, that set us on this footing and kind of distinguishes us was that since 2006, we've had a community, full-time community organizer on staff. And that means that that person doesn't just sit here in the office and wait for people to reach out to them, um, but that they, their job is basically to go out into the community, be in community spaces, in offices, community celebrations, meetings, et cetera, and looking for opportunities for collaboration, um, looking for what are the things that that people are already doing and how, how can we contribute to that. And feeling like there's somebody from the museum that is part of the community that knows people um, in, in, a, in a kind of very personal way. 
um, and that understands the culture, the, the varieties of cultures of different organizations in the community. Um, and sometimes that just means like doing things, participating in things, adding value to things that people want to do. And, and um, so some of the things that we heard is that Corona residents felt like they were being neglected by um, the city government and that man, uh, sanitation and upkeep, um, you know, the, uh, you know, of streets and parks and plazas was, were not up to snuff and uh, people felt like this was because there was a large non-voting population. And so they wanted to really do some things to, to push the city and to, to push their elected officials to um, beautify and improve the, the kind of physical assets of the neighborhood. Um, and one of the ways that we did that was to get people together to do beautification events, invite our elected officials to, to see that the community was ready to be partners in that, and that uh, oftentimes we heard narratives where, you know, um, the city would give excuses. Oh, if we plant plants, you know, they get stolen by people in the neighborhood, or, you know, it, it has to do with the fact that, you know, the people in this neighborhood, um, you know, are throwing their trash everywhere or putting residential trash in, you know, into city bins, and therefore it's not our fault. So we heard all of these kinds of, of of narratives in which the, the residents were being blamed and so we created opportunities, public events and campaigns that allowed these these two groups to work together and to prove some of those narratives wrong. Um, the other thing was to, to actually activate unused or, or you know lightly used public spaces or transform public spaces that were uh, not really being used that way into spaces that could showcase local culture. Um, so there was a place that was called Corona Plaza right off the subway stop, but um, was actually a parking lot, um, you know, not actually used as a public plaza. So we said, well, what if we actually turned it into a public plaza, uh, turned it into a place that we could be proud of? And so at first we just started getting block party permits and, and doing, you know, monthly festivals, uh, getting a variety of different stakeholders um, to the table, including social social service organizations. One of the, the other things that people said was a priority was improving health in the neighborhood. A lot of people didn't have access to health care, um, you know, or they didn't have access to screenings and therefore waited a long time before, you know, with their health deteriorating before they took action. And so we just brought the health services to these public plazas um, and then and actually attracted a lot of people to them through the cultural programming. And so, you know, the first couple of summers that we started doing this, we signed up 600 people to low cost health care. We screened over a thousand people for diabetes and high blood pressure. Um, and so, you know, there were ways in which we were trying to 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 change the the sense that people had about what these spaces could do uh, and, and and connect people who were doing advocacy and providing services with pe people who are doing cultural work. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over a bunch of things that um, you know I had hoped to share with you about public art. Um, but there are um, ways in which we wove that into um, those initial street festivals. And then what we learned from that is that people really wanted and needed a longer term uh, and more flexible way for to engage with um, artist projects, um, and so we started something called Corona Studio, the first of which um, was a project with a Cuban artist um, named Tanya Bruguera, and she developed this kind of off-site space um, called Immigrant Movement International that then became a place um, that functioned on multiple registers as a place for artists interested in the issue of immigration as the human rights issue of the 21st century. Um, a, a fact that I think is being borne out now <laughs> as we see images of the refugee crisis from Syria and so forth and, and the reactions of and the inundation of different um, European countries and how they're responding to that crisis, that, you know, it's not just economic migration, but people responding to the ins global instability and the right to move um, and, and issues of, of criminalization of people. Um, who have had to move for those reasons. This is a group of, of local residents, artists, and intellectuals, academics, like coming up with pro-immigrant slogans at Immigrant Movement. 
These are day laborers who are um, learning about workplace safety and rights um, through theater games. Um, this is a youth orchestra that um, was founded and started uh, here, and they still practice in this space. This project, by the way, has been ongoing for four and a half years. Um, and as long as the community finds it useful, we will find a way to continue it. Um, this is a group of dreamers. These are young people, people who are undocumented but were brought by their adults when they were minors, who are organizing themselves and developing cultural strategies to promote um, change in legislation. Um, these are projects here, again, in Corona Plaza where, you know, we've had collected people's problems and then had think tanks throughout the world come up with uh, potential solutions to their type. Here's Here's a kind of close-up where you can give the problem. Um, here's an example of some of the solutions to those problems. Uh, one of the problems mentioned most was police harassment of immigrants uh, for loitering. This is a kind of Andrew Fraser style kind of response that people could use as a, as a kind of um, script in dealing with uh, police that harass them. This is another, um, which was kind of like creating these unofficial legal waiting zones um, in the neighborhood um, to challenge people about, you know, what they could and couldn't do in public space. Um, here's another cultural tool where uh, New Immigrant Com uh, Community Empowerment, uh, which is an organization that works with day laborers, um, developed a series of uh, graphic novels in collaboration with artists that we um, commissioned. Um, based on people's experiences of consumer fraud. Um, so these are kind of, you know, fraudulent legal services that were targeting undocumented immigrants in the community, for example. Um, so that's definitely a way. And, and the other thing, just to close, because I know that we're running out of time, um, is that we have a collaboration with our local public college, Queens College, part of the city university system. Um, that allows students and um, professors in that community to work alongside us and our artists and our community organizer um, to, to build on these projects. And now we have, for example, Corona Plaza uh, working with urban planning students and art students to, to design it into an actual public plaza. This is a temporary plaza and actually starting January of 2016. Uh, you know, we've removed the traffic and, and turned it into this vibrant space. And then starting in 2016, we'll actually have um, the finally designed plaza um, in place. And so you could see kind of over the course of 10 years how a variety of artist interventions and museum support have helped the local community to actually make change outside the community. And I will leave it there so that we can move to the next presenter and we'll take questions at the end. Thanks very much, Prana. That's that's fantastic. Uh, it was a, a, an amazing run through of uh, just just how embedded uh, the museum is uh, in the Queen's community in terms of doing highly relevant artistic work, um, doing things jointly with the community, really breaking down uh, kind of kind of metaphorically breaking down the walls of the museum and kind of really developing very strong roots into the community. Um, I'm conscious of trying to move on uh, in terms of time, so uh, I'm going to pass you over now to Chris in Almera. So, uh, Chris, over to you, please, sir. Okay. Well, uh, my presentation is about uh, libraries in general, about my library, library in the public uh, library of Almera, and I'll tell you something about how we cope with changes in society and changes in uh, uh, customer wants, etc. Uh, I show you, this is a picture of a library without a roof and uh, I think that stands a bit for the uh, situation we are in. Uh, I, I always say it has never been so interesting in public libraries, in libraries since the invention of uh, book print. So there's a lot of, of things, a lot of is, uh, is going on. Um, because of the changes we'll have, we're trying to bring the library to the next level. We try to imagine the next level and to to get there. And I, uh, this is uh, a picture of the library I work in. Uh, the dark window, part of the dark window is, is my office. I am there now at, uh, uh, right now. Um, this is the central library. 
we opened five years ago, 2010. Um, and it is, uh, we're trying to be successful as a hub in, uh, in, in community and to deal with changing customer wants uh, in Almere. Almere is uh, very much a new town. It's built on the bottom of the sea. This was the closing of the Afsluitdijk, as we call it, uh, the closing dike. Uh, and it uh, closes the former South Sea. So uh, that's the red line, that's the dike. And the red star is uh, where I'm now at the moment, the city of Almere. <coughs> uh, when there was no, would be no dike, uh, I would be sitting in the water at, uh, at the moment. Uh, and Almere is very much a new town. Uh, it started 40 years ago with 47 inhabitants. And now there are 197,000 inhabitants. And the planning is that it will grow to about 300,000 inhabitants. Uh, that stands for 2025. But uh, I don't think that's, uh, that's realistic anymore because of some uh, dangerous bankers and the economic crisis they, uh, they developed uh, in recent years. Uh, but it's very much a new town. <coughs> it's uh, next to Amsterdam. Sorry. Um, so we're part of the metro metropolitan, metropolitan of, uh, of Amsterdam. So a lot of people who live in Almere work in Amsterdam, uh, in the service industry, in uh, the airport, uh, etc. Et so a lot of people travel every day to Amsterdam or it or other cities, and there isn't. It's very much uh, a, a new town and a city where people sleep and uh, have their spare time, but they work in, in other places in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, at the end of the 20th century, there were plans for building a new city center and it was uh, at the beginning of this century it it's, it uh, it was uh, realized it was opened and at the end of the 20th century uh, many people thought that retail was king there couldn't be shops enough uh, so there are a lot of shops in the city center uh, of Almere and as you see it's shops uh, Gardens on the shops and housing above the shops. So it's 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 uh, planned by Rem Koolhaas, a famous uh, Dutch architect uh, who didn't do the architecture of the city center, but uh, the, the the designing of the uh, of the center itself. This is not a picture. A lot of shops and uh, and people. And this was the the old library. Uh, it was uh, built in the 1980s. It was rather a uh, uh, simple, a bit dull building. And because of the growth of the city, uh, we needed to build another new library. And, and of course, of course, we didn't want to be it an old-fashioned library, like you see here. We have a lot of books on a lot of shelves. We were very much thinking how to cope with the wants of of and needs of uh, present customers, the wants and needs of the city. And of course, these wants and needs have a lot to do with the internet. The internet brings along, uh, uh, goes along with a lot of changes, changes on uh, individual needs, uh, on uh, companies, shops, uh, on society in general. Because uh, due to the internet, uh, information, books are no longer firm, they are liquid, they are even gas. Uh, when you have your, uh, your device, you can get information and books, you can get it everywhere. So that means a lot for libraries, because you don't have to go to a library anymore to, to, to get a book. You can get it everywhere, you can get information everywhere. But still, in the internet age, reading is of the utmost importance because what you do on the web is a lot of that you read there's a lot of visual but reading is still very important 
uh, there's the clear and present danger of information overload and libraries can do something about that and people want to keep to have oversight uh, they want uh, there's the danger that people are in their own little niche uh, of their work and the friends they have and it's very uh, uh, urgent to have oversight to see more than you ask for so libraries have to offer inspiration inspiration to read inspiration to be curious inspiration to be informed to get information uh, and you might see say people in the libraries need seduction uh, people need to be seduced to read to get information and to be curious so libraries have to change and that's difficult but very necessary I'll show you some uh, pictures of uh, of our library. Uh, this is uh, the picture of the of the new central library. You see, it looks quite different from an old-fashioned library. It looks very much like a bookshop because we think that libraries can learn a lot uh, from bookshops, uh, warehouses, and other shops about uh, from present how how you present uh, the things you have in stock. That's another picture. Uh, a lot of computers, a good furniture, good lighting, an attractive uh, environment. Lots of space, pleasant surroundings. Good study facility facilities. Uh, a lot of people don't want to study at home, but uh, especially young people want to study in a central place where they meet other people. So we have great facilities for that, and they are very heavily used. An attractive uh, children's uh, library uh, to read books, to get books, but also to play and to meet other children. These uh, cubes are very popular to play with. That's another picture. It's a library, but it could be a bookshop. That's our cafe with uh, magazines, newspapers, uh, coffee, lunch, soup, etc. So these people, uh, this uh, picture show how we try to cope with uh, the needs of uh, modern customers. And in this library, we get about 900,000 visit, visits a year. And that's quite a lot for a library in a city of 197,000 uh, inhabitants. And here you see, the, you see a lot of those 900,000 900, visitors. We call ourselves the Nieuwe Bibliotheek, the new library. And the new library is, in general, the idea of the library as a shop. Customer intimacy is very important. So we try train our staff in uh, being user friendly and we train our staff in marketing, etc. Opening hours, we are open seven days a week. Good facilities, computers, furniture, etc. An extensive cultural program. And very important for our library is the location. I always say in the Middle Ages, there, there would be a, a church on this place, but they built a library in the, in the 21st, in the 21st century. Good architect, architecture of a famous architect and a good interior design. And in general, quality is very important. Quality for customers, quality for society, because offering good quality is what people want. Uh, part of the library is that we offer a library, a, a, a big library, but in the library there are shops, uh, a kind of shops, N not literally, but uh, we divided uh, our customers in uh, segments, and for every segment there's a shop in the library. And the system is as follows, this is the type of segmentation. On the vertical line you see extrovert people versus introvert people. To the left, individualistic, and to the right, 
group oriented and that gives you five segments of our customers and we all give them a color not literally but in our minds they are colored people and these are the five types the yellow type easy going reading is pleasure green blue self-confident independent reading is active relaxation aqua and red red is self-fulfillment passion is most of them are students young people uh, this is the yellow group that's a big part of our customer population active adult members mostly mothers and their young children uh, children books have to be at hand of their own books and the choice of books is fiction thrillers and romantic novels and non-fiction cooking gardening and help and in most libraries fiction is separated from non-fiction but our shops contain fiction as well as non-fiction that's the living we call the shop the living the fresh section is for the youngest group they don't regularly visit the library heavy users of the internet and the choice of books is fiction thrillers and non-fiction is about traveling literature and going out the lee is the green group well you can read uh, the characteristics fiction thrillers and family novels non-fiction creativity environment and gardening high voltage is an important group and we offer them thrillers detectives books about war and traveling and vocation management and computers the viewing hall that's my uh, window uh, that's my uh, shop to be uh, to be fair uh, that's about literature psychological books art and culture and travel literature uh, and most library tend most libraries tend to take this group as their focus group uh, and that's a bit of the that's quite a misunderstanding a lot of people don't belong to this group now that's the segmentation again you see the fresh section high voltage the viewing hall the lee and the living and as i showed you on the pictures uh the, the library is well you couldn't see it very good on the pictures but the library is divided into sh shops and these shops all, all have their own atmosphere this is about the results since we started this new library you you can see it, the success in members in lending especially in visitors it, it more than doubled and in percentage of the members of the city at the moment uh, almost 37 percent of the inhabitants of the city is a member of the library and uh, in Holland uh, membership is not free that's different from the states and the UK you'll have to when you're uh, above 18 years old you'll have to pay for the library well, we call this the new library and sometimes people ask what does it mean well new is in the sense of new different further that's our program and sometimes people ask how long can you call yourself a new library and then i always respond with le pont neuf in paris it's the oldest bridge in paris but they still call it the new bridge so centuries after this we hope that this library is still the new library uh, but that's also a program and we always have to consider how to get to the next level uh, i take for example coffee you get from a commodity to a good to a service to an experience and trying to get to the new, to the new next level is how you get from a service to an experience who, who you offer and how you offer an experience in the library we'll have to do with this megatrends we think that people want inspiration 
sincere attention, cooperation, fresh craftsmanship, clever convenience and playfulness, and we try to implement this in the library. This is what we want, the new library to be surprising, many-sided and inspiring. And to conclude with, reading will, will be very important and will be part of our core business of the library. Reading is important because reading means better education, better jobs and better partners. That's not just a librarian talking. But you can find that in all kinds of surveys. Reading means better education, better jobs, and in the end, getting a better partner. I have a little movie, but I think there's not enough time for that. So this is my presentation. Thank you. OK for time, Chris. Um, I, can, I can play the video. Um, I know you were just about to finish there anyway. So if I play the video now. Uh, and then we can go straight into the Q&A. De perfecte combinatie van ontwikkeling en ontspanning. Een bron van inspiratie voor jong en oud. Dat is de nieuwe bibliotheek. Welkom bij de nieuwe bibliotheek. Verrassend veelzijdig. Dat is het aanbod van de nieuwe bibliotheek. Voor iedereen die op de hoogte wil blijven van de nieuwste maatschappelijke, literaire en culturele ontwikkelingen. Naast de enorme collectie boeken biedt de nieuwe bibliotheek een zeer compleet aanbod. Met onder meer film en theater in een speciaal daarvoor ingerichte zaal. Een aparte zaal voor het spelen van games. Het nieuwscafé met veel kranten en tijdschriften. En uitstekende studiefaciliteiten. De nieuwe bibliotheek is er niet alleen voor studeren, lenen en lezen, maar draagt ook op een uitdagende manier bij aan het culturele aanbod van Almere. Elke donderdagavond is er een voorstelling in de theaterzaal. Van stand-up comedy tot singer-songwriter en literaire lezing. Op zondag zijn er familievoorstellingen en drie keer per week wordt een actuele film vertoond. Elke maand worden diverse activiteiten rond een thema georganiseerd, zoals informatiemarkten, workshops, presentaties en cursussen. Tot ziens! Kortom, de nieuwe bibliotheek, the place to be. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, and thank you very much, Prerana. Um, two, two really amazing presentations, uh, and I think the thing that came across from both presentations was uh, the breaking down of boundaries. So you, you're, no, you're clearly no longer these. This we're a library, we do books. We're in a museum, we have these exhibitions, and you come to us. It's you know, you're having an organizer, you you're see yourselves as a, an active neighbor uh, in the case of the museum and the, the, the library trying to take lessons from, from the private sector, from bookshops um, and breaking down the barrier between fiction and non-fiction. So just, uh, just really sort of exemplifying this responsiveness to users, I think. So I think um, there are time for some questions. Uh, there are a few questions, I think, um, here that probably apply to uh, both of the presenters. Um, and, and the first thing I suppose, I mean, I said it's not all about funding at the beginning, but obviously everyone wants to know about funding. So there's a few questions here about, about how, how your activities are funded and resourced. And I, I was very interested in the, the Almir, uh, the, the Dutch library issue of paying for libraries. So, if you could both just say a little bit more about how, how your organizations are funded and how your your innovative work is funded, please, in particular. Um, let's start with Parash, spoken for a while. Okay. Um, well, in general, the Queen's Museum um, is mostly funded through grants from private, private foundation. My department is fully grant funded, including all of the staff salaries, not just the programming costs. Um, we do have some government support. Um, it, the building belongs to the city of New York City, um, and so there is a kind of line item from the city budget that helps support the maintenance and upkeep of um, the building. We are uh, by suggested donation, and given the kind of um, demographics of folks who come, we want to make sure that you know paying is not a barrier to entry to any of our programs. Uh, we don't charge any extra ticket fee for any so far any public program. Um, you know, in my 11 years in here. <laughs> and um, so for us, like, I think that we're, you know, the kinds of work that we are doing is we can find different types of funding 
because it may not just be kind of arts, typical arts funding or typical museum funding. Uh, we have gotten funds, you know, through, you know, health grants and, and city funds for, you know, public health initiatives since we, we kind of connect to that work and have partners in that work. Um, we have gotten money from community development organizations. And I think there is a real trend in the United States, um, at least, and probably elsewhere, uh, where, you know, there's an interest in, in what we call social practice art or the, the, the ways in which art is addressing pressing social issues of our time and, you know, engaging with, with a diverse audience and not just a kind of more traditional, um, you know, high art kind of uh, audience. And so I think that actually what we're doing is creating uh, opportunities for different types of funding than, than we would in terms of the types of grants that we're able to apply for. And, and I think part of that also is about the relationships that we're able to have with funders to kind of push on them about what the role of a museum should be or could be and that it, it, that it isn't, as you said, limited by kind of what happens in the four walls of the museum, but also kind of the museum as part of a community ecology and, and with a social responsibility to that. Um, so I think that like this, you know, the, it's very rare actually for museums to have a different department of education and a department of programming and community engagement. Usually it's one. And by us moving that, that allowed us to kind of change our culture. It allowed us, as I mentioned before, to kind of hire people with different backgrounds and training and then also like be more strategic in terms of like what kinds of grant funding that, that we can go for. And I think that in a lot of ways, like the collaborations that we have also bring other resources that we don't have to the picture. So there's no way using just the grant funding that we have that we could do the kind of quantity and the, and the variety of programs that we have now. It's, it's that our partners are also bringing their assets sometimes, you know, and their staffing and their, um, you know, human resources to the table. And so I think that that this model is not just about us sharing our resources, it's, it's, it's both ways. And so we benefit from that as well. And it's very hard to put a, a dollar amount on that. But I, I could tell you that if, if we were doing everything ourselves, that, you know, that we are currently doing, you know, through a variety of collaborations, it, it would be impossible. Um, and I think that, you know, Queens is, for the United States, a model of what's to come. I mean, you know, we are seeing greater diversity of people, like more minority uh, populations in, in many cities, not just big urban centers and on the coast, but also throughout the country and in the south. And so these experiments that we're making, we believe, um, you know, can be models for the cities of the future. Um, and Chris, could you, could you say a little bit about uh, the funding issue, please, uh, in, in the Netherlands? Yeah, in, in general, it's very, uh, it's, it's very simple. Uh, we get, uh, for 85% of our budget, we are funded uh, by the city. And for uh, 50 for the, the rest, 50%, uh, we are funded by uh, members who pay for uh, library services. So that, that's, in general, the picture. And is it expensive? I mean, is it, is it a, an issue of kind of controversy about, about paying for libraries or is it accepted? Uh, no, no, not, not in Almere. Uh, that, that, uh, it's very uh, uh, that, that's different from, another, from a lot of other places, but the city is very proud of the library. So we are quite uh, successful in, uh, in, in get, to get paid for uh, the services we want to deliver. Um, but of, of course, we, we depend on politics, so you never know uh, how it, 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 it may change. But uh, since we opened this library, uh, we are, uh, the city is very positive about our services. OK, and I think we uh, have a first here in the, the webinars. And one of the presenters has got a question for one of the other presenters. So uh, Piranha, I think you have a question for uh, Chris. Please, please fire away. Um, you know, just as a kind of piece of background, we have lots of collaborations with the Queen's Public Library System, and we're actually, yeah, in two yeah. years, going to have a branch of the public library within the museum. And so we're just okay. now starting to think about, you know, what are the opportunities of, of co-locating these two 
um, cultural institutions. And the Queens Public Library is the largest circulating library in the United States. And and okay, yeah, I, you know, I've been there United two years ago. You were there, okay. So you're familiar yeah, yeah, with yeah. it, and yeah, and it has a very yeah, different yeah. model <laughs> than yours in the sense that yeah. I think is very much fo focused on the types of services and educational opportunities and like people accessing yeah. technology, getting job help, uh, you know, homework help, literacy. It's, I think it's the largest ESOL, English, is, English um, language class provider in the city of New York. And, and, and that yeah. becomes kind of the basis as opposed to the kind of consumer approach um, that you're talking about. And I'm wondering kind of in what ways um, you mentioned a kind of cultural program, but in what ways is the educational programming or, you know, opportunities also a piece of how you think about your library? Well, they are an important part of our library. Uh, I just had to emphasize uh, the, the marketing aspects and customer intimacy, etc. But they are an important part of our, of our program. But in general, it, uh, it has to do a lot with lit illiteracy uh, mm -hmm. and uh, helping people to find their way with computers and on the internet. So it, it's a part of our program, but I think not as much as in Queen's Library, because our mm -hmm. po population is quite uh, d different. Uh, the, mm -hmm. Of course, there are uh, illiterate people in Almere, but I think uh, not as much uh, as in an, uh, uh, very much an, in an immigration part of the country. Question here about uh, kind of what you're obviously very responsive to your users. That's very clear, but I mean, are there times where you've had to say no to things that, that perhaps are just not something that you want to get involved in, but that the ideas that come from the community, or, or maybe in the case of books, or particular types of book, or particular types of activity in the library, things you've had to say no to? Um, well, it's not so much about things that we want to say no to. I mean, there's a complicated legal limitation of being a nonprofit, um, you know, in the United States, and, and kind of positions we can and cannot take vis-a-vis -vis legislation, um, you know, political campaigns, et cetera. And, you know, that can sometimes be a complicated thing when we're, we're working with partners who may take particular stands on these issues um, or, or particular elected officials or, or legislation. And we also, as individuals and activists and people who work in the neighborhood might have our individual um, you know, feelings about these things. And so, you know, we have to work, work very hard to frame our, our interventions in a way as, as a kind of platform for, you know, the issues to be worked out as a kind of convening space for that and to make sure we don't fall into a place where, um, you know, we can be threatening our nonprofit status. Um, so that's definitely, you know, a line that we, you know, we have to be much more careful about than most museums because of the type of work that we're engaging in, um, you know, off-site and the, the kind of issues um, that we're engaging in. And, and, and we think that policy is important, that artists and cultural producers should be engaged in policy and should be engaged in their neighborhood. And so, um, so that is, is, is a kind of tricky line. Um, I think also, you know, sometimes we do, when you have these kind of spaces, you know, that are open to proposals or open calls, et cetera, you know, um, it can be challenging to explain what our criteria are, you know, we're, you know, around quality versus kind of democratic openness and what are the expectations of, of, of the kind of curatorial uh, processes involved in, in selecting like which partners are we working with, um, which, you know, like when we have a, a partnership gallery, we, you know, say it's not a place for people to just propose, um, projects that are, you know, solo shows or just another way of kind of getting a show at the museum, but really something that is about partnership and that, that displays some kind of partnership um, with the museum community. Um, and, and that becomes a showcase for that and not just a kind of like B-level gallery, you know, <laughs> that our curators aren't involved with. Um, so I think those are kinds of challenges that we have with our, our model. Um. 
Well, we we don't have that kind of problems. We 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 try uh, to cope with uh, the needs of our customers, and there aren't much many boundaries. Uh, so we we consider whether it's it's it, it meets with our brand. We we're trying to make a brand of the new library, <coughs> but in general, uh, a, a, a lot of things are possible. I mean, I, I remember reading recently that I think it was Moscow Library uh, were, were yeah. saying that they weren't going to spend on things that the public wanted, Fifty Shades of Grey and that kind of stuff. I mean, are those issues for you about how you uh, order no, different types have, of books? And no, no, we, we have that book in the in the in the collection. Uh, I, I'm not proud <laughs> on it, but <laughs> there's people want to read it, so uh, we'll have it in the collection. Thank you. And then, um, just a sort of another question that I think is apply, applicable to both, really. I mean, obviously, you were talking about all these boundaries breaking down and new kind of demands, if you like, of staff at, at both of your organizations. So I wonder what you think about that in terms of future training of museum managers and librarians. Does it does it mean a different type of training for them? Does it mean a different type yeah. of recruitment, hiring? Do you want to take that uh, one, yeah, please? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Uh, uh, hiring people is, is very important. Education is very important. But in general, uh, we, we emphasize a lot on customer intimacy, on uh, being friendly to customers. And most uh, of our, uh, well, pe pe almost everyone wants to do his book, his job properly. Uh, so. People were really mot motivated by this development. They they, they liked it. A, lo a lot of people uh, would have wished that for uh, for 25 years ago. So so they were relieved that that was the course the library was taking. Um, so in, in general, uh, pe people were very positive about it. Uh, I think the next step is how you get our people uh, involved in uh, in the internet in, in, in being in being digital that's a bit more difficult but in general uh, the attitude is very positive yeah I mean from my part I think that everything that we start you know is about kind of like you open the door and then you see how complicated the issue is how much more there is to learn so if we think about multilingual programming or addressing a multilingual audience you know, it's not just enough to, you know, have multilingual signs or, you know, promotional material. It's, it's actually how you structure the program, you know, you know, thinking about different types of ways of including people, you know, from language support to, you know, the gold standard of simultaneous translation, how you actually think about making space in your program, you know, to do that and to train audiences, to use that technology, you know, all of these things, you know, once you open that door, there's more and more skills and thinking, you know, about about how to actually do that well um, and to the next level. And so, you know, we're in the midst of, you know, while, you know, compared to 10 years ago, we're, we're way ahead of where we were in terms of having multilingual staff and, you know, kind of frontline staff who are engaging with the public who, who um, have had training on on kind of language justice issues, but you know, on the kind of programming level, we're still figuring out how to how to create programs that that truly do that, and figuring out how many programs need to do that. Um, and um, you know, and that's just one thing around language justice. Uh, we're also thinking about um, access for people with different types of developmental and physical disabilities. Um, and so, once you open the door on how do you train people for that, you know, we have three art therapists on staff and a dedicated art making studio, um, you know, and even then, you know, there's still many things that we can't offer in terms of access or equal types of experiences for everyone that we like to. Um, and so, you know, I think that the training, part of it is technological and part of it is just there's, there's so many different kind of justice paradigms and access paradigms. Um, that that there's a lot to learn about and are are in constant progress. So you're never there's, you never kind of reach it. It's always you know um, something that's aspirational. Great. 
Okay. Um, well, listen, I'm just conscious of the time now. Um, I want to thank um, both, both of our presenters, Piranha Reddy of Queen's Museum in New York City, uh, Chris Viesma of the New Library in Almere in the Netherlands, Almera. Um, thank you to, to you for listening.